<clears throat> this is an experiment for me. I used to be a lecturer at, at Edinburgh uh, and Manchester universities, and um, I, I still find it a little bit weird just speaking at the screen, but um, you know, there's the chance to chat. And then at the end, we can have a discussion about pretty much anything that you like. Um, also, just to point out that there's possibly people from a wide range of backgrounds here. I'm, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and my course is aiming to be um, quite broad and general. So although I'm a chemist and a materials physicist by background, I'm going to try and touch on areas of biology and engineering and so forth. Um, so it means that there may be bits of this that um, I'll, I'll give it as a slideshow in a moment. Um, take us back to where we were at the last lecture. Um, so there will be things that maybe aren't quite your area and you may just want to you know, tune out and wait till something else comes along. Um, but I'm hoping not to have it to, to pitch it at a level where at least, you know, you'll be able to see a, a wider breadth of applications, perhaps beyond your own uh, immediate area of uh, interest. So, um, <clears throat> end of the last lecture, um, we were tying up the application of synchrotron x-rays in um, crystallography. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm just going to mute a second cough. Um, it's not very cool, is it? Um, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so the last part of the diffraction presentation was on a technique called resonant X-ray scattering. And here we take advantage again of the fact that you can tune synchrotron X-rays to a particular energy. And when you tune the synchrotron to the energy of an electronic transition in the element, you get an enhanced effect, uh, an, a, a component of the scattering that tells you about the character of um, the orbital into which you've excited the electron. So if you tune the photon energy to excite an electron from the ground state into this excited state, there will be an additional component of the scattering that's very weak, but it still gives you information about the, um, the, the orbital and the spin character of this particular state. Um, because we're using synchrotron x-rays with very sensitive detectors, we can start to see these really weak transitions. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, as you may know, um, uh, ooh, why is it not changing? Sorry about this. Let me just, um, <clears throat> it is changing, but very slowly. I'm sorry, my computer is grinding to a halt. Um, it's interesting to be able to do this because the chemical and the physical properties of key elements in the periodic table, mostly transition metals and lanthanides, um, depend on the uh, occupation of specific orbitals. So the magnetic properties, a lot of the conducting properties, depend on exactly which orbitals are occupied by electrons. Um, so synchrotron x-rays can tell us about the fundamental uh, materials chemistry and physics of compounds con containing these materials. And it's absolutely critical for our understanding of materials such as superconductors and magnetoresistors, which are at the, the heart of an awful lot of important um, devices. Now, the transition itself um, uh, is subject, as all electronic transitions are, to <coughs> selection rules. So generally, we're exciting from a ground S state. We only see strong transitions into P states. Um, but again, because we use very bright X-rays, we can start to see some of these very subtle forbidden transitions. But with all spectroscopic transitions, there's always something that breaks down the selection rule. And I ended up at the last lecture saying, <coughs> One of the things that we can directly measure by this technique is the magnetic structure of materials. And I gave this rather simple example. It's a cubic <coughs> magnet. The magnetic ions are, are the manganese ions, um, and you can view their magnetic character at an atomic level with an arrow. It's a bit like your compass needle. And in a material such as this, when you cool it down, the individual atomic moments at some temperature freeze to form an ordered array. And one consequence of that for the structure is that the unit cell, the minimum repeat this unit in space, goes from, uh, if, you, if you can just see my cursor here, th this is the uh, nuclear unit cell, the ordinary crystal structure, so a little cube here. When, <clears throat> when the magnetic moments freeze, this atom and this atom become different because the magnetic moment on each of these atoms is now pointing in a different direction. And the new repeat 
um, distance in this direction is is not um, this 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 separation here, but it's twice this, this separation. And the consequence of that is that when you go through this magnetic ordering transition, you start to see additional scattering from this new um, magnetic structure. Um, it's extremely weak, it's extremely subtle, but with powerful synchrotrons, you can actually start to pick out these features. And in this particular case, what we see is as we cool down the magnetic material below a certain temperature where this magnetic ordering occurs, in this case, just the above 80 Kelvin, you start to see the growth of additional um, diffraction peaks as this magnetic structure becomes more and more distinct. And this has become one of the key ways of looking at magnetic structures in materials at, at low temperatures. So finally, and again, just to tie off this section, the other kind of property um, of materials, the, these resonant X-ray um, scattering techniques reveal is to do with their orbital um, ordering. And again, if you've not done this in a physics or a chemistry course, you may wish to just sort of um, step back a little bit here. But um, many of you will be familiar with what's called the Yarn Teller effect. So if you have an atom which has, which contains um, uh, unpaired uh, 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 electrons in certain types of orbitals, notably um, d orbitals that material will spontaneously distort its structure to minimize the energy and lower um, the energy of the electrons. Um, so to give you an example, and, and I should say in passing that this effect um, is not only very widespread, but it's at the heart of certain really um, important phenomena like superconductivity. So the famous high TC superconductors that we discovered in the mid eighties, potentially have amazingly useful properties to allow us to um, uh, produce extremely efficient electrical devices. Um, but at the moment, we don't, we still do not understand 35 years later, it's still one of the outstanding mysteries of physics, what is a fundamental reason for the, for the behavior of these materials. But what we do know <clears throat> is the yarn teller effect on ions such as copper two plus does play a role. And in copper two plus, so the iron copper two plus, for example, in the in the compound um, potassium copper fluoride has uh, has uh, nine 3d electrons so it's not quite um, the fully filled subshell which would have 10 3d electrons and one consequence of that um, is that the structure spontaneously distorts so um, in the ideal structure and here's just a, here's a here's a cartoon of the cubic structure of copper fluoride the fluorine uh, atoms these little ones on the edges the, the, the potassium is in the, is, is in the middle, and I've depicted the copper atoms um, uh, in terms of these, 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 these orbital shapes. And in the copper, in, the, in this particular compound, the structural distortion, the yarn teller effect, is such that um, the, the bond length along one direction gets bigger, and in the other two directions, so X, Y, and Z, get shorter. So if you look at this, this cube, what you find if you look along this edge is this fluorine atom um, is further from this copper than from this copper. Uh, and the reason for that in, in chemical terms is that um, it, it, the, the, of the, all the orbitals in, the, in this particular material, the so-called x squared minus y squared, which has this shape, is the one that's half occupied. Um, and if, if you don't mind, maybe to yep. put the full screen, because I don't know if you were showing some of the atom. Because it, oh, uh, sorry. Christine, what can you see? Uh, the, the slides, but not yep. for your mouse. So if you put it full screen, maybe this is... Oh, what, um, is it not full screen? Uh, no, we have oh, gosh. the the... Ah, I'm really sorry about this. So let me just... Um, I, I'm not really I, sure what's going on here. Let, 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 so I don't know if it's... Yeah, I, I think I must... So you don't think I'm in um, slide presentation mode? It's not slide presentation mode. Right, I'm really sorry about this. Okay, let me just... Um, let me go back into it again. Don't know what happened there. And thank you for um, reminding me. Right, so uh, tell me if this works. Um, it was before, unfortunately. Oh, did it jump out of it? No, it's Is okay. That... No, it's okay, yeah. It's okay. And if you have your cursor and move it. Yeah, can, can you can... see it? Yeah, that works now. Okay, so in this structure, the fact that this particular um, atomic level in copper is only partly occupied means that in the structure, the, 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 the copper atom, which ought to be coordinated by a perfect 
octahedral arrangement of fluorine is now distorted so that this fluorine is further away than this one, for example. Um, so we end up with a structural distortion as a consequence of this um, uh, incomplete filling of the orbitals. And we see in the resonant X-ray scattering uh, a very marked effect as a consequence of this. What we also see is because the copper orbitals are not completely occupied, there is a magnetic moment associated with each one. And as we cool that material down, and I've depicted that magnetic moment with these little arrows here, if we cool it down below a certain temperature, the forces, the magnetic forces between the atoms overcome the thermal uh, energy and you get freezing into a, a magnetic, or, magnetic ordered array. And resonant X-ray scattering through its ability to, um, to, to measure the magnetic character of these orbitals um, is able to reveal the point at which the magnetic order sets in. So again, um, by performing RICS measurements, uh, sorry, or, yeah, RICS measurements, as we, we, we say in the shorthand, um, you can start to observe the onset um, of magnetic order. And again, I should say that because these are spectroscopic transition, the resonant process, um, uh, the direct excitation into the, the orbital of interest is, is forbidden according to spectroscopic selection rules. Um, and because these rules are not quite perfect, um, you, you can see a small amount of additional scattering um, as a consequence of the resonant process from 1s to 3d. Um, alternatively, if you excite the ground state electrons into the p orbitals, the p orbitals themselves have no magnetic information, but the p and the d orbitals again uh, mix to a small extent. So again, you see a rather weak effect um, in this in this resonant transition because the little bit of 3d character is mixed into the 4p character. So both of these resonant transitions um, provide weak but distinct indication of the magnetic structure. And as the material orders on cooling, in this case, it's around about 40 Kelvin, um, you start to see the onset of order. And again, this is an example where, and we'll see this more directly with neutrons, um, but it's a wonderful complement to, to neutron scattering because among other things, because the X-rays we use are so bright, you can look at this effect in very small amounts of materials and in thin films of materials. As we'll see in neutron scattering, the samples need to be very much bigger. And although the, the effect is, is much more straightforward with neutrons, um, it can't be applied to samples that are very small. And many of these systems um, that can be probed whose magnetic structure is important to understand uh, are, 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 are mostly used in devices in the form of thin films or fine particles. So, Rick's coming through as a, a very powerful probe to reveal magnetic and ultimately uh, the origin of superconducting properties um, in, in materials. So two more slides on diffraction and then we'll finish. Now, diffraction is not all about measuring the, um, the atomic structures we saw in protein crystallography uh, and the structure of inorganic systems and including powders. Um, it's also used to reveal the structure of very large objects through a technique called small angle X-ray scattering. Actually, that should be there should be an X-ray uh, in here. Um, and just have a think for a moment about the nature of, of, of Bragg's law. If we were able to measure the scattering from an object, and I've depicted that in the cartoon here. So we have an X-ray source with a producing a beam which hits some kind of sample, um, and normally in in crystallography, we measure the scattering through uh, uh, degrees, tens of degrees, um, all the way through almost to 180 degrees. So this is actually what we would call wide angle X-ray scattering. It's the basis of crystallography. Um, if we look at the nature of the scattering at very small angles, fractions, perhaps a hundredth of one degree, then if, if we refer ourselves back to the Bragg equation, if the scattering angle theta is extremely small for a given wavelength, that implies the, the spacing in the object is extremely large. So if, if we could measure diffraction down to hundredths of a degree, we would be able to measure, and, and if, if lambda is typically um, uh, 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 a wavelength that's of the order of the spacing between atoms, then we'd actually be able to measure objects that were hundreds of atoms across. And that's exactly what we do in small angle X-ray scattering. And I'll actually come back to this more with the neutron measurements, but it's really to say that by looking at scattering, analyzing the scattering through these very small angles, you can measure large objects 
or you can measure um, uh, uh, defects and discontinuity in large objects. So this is a technique, and I, here, here is a typical diffractometer. So this tube that you can see here in the picture is about 10 meters long. Um, the sample will be here and the detector is here. And this enables you, by putting the detector a long way from your sample, you can measure scattering through these tiny, tiny angles. Uh, and these uh, devices, these small ang angle X-ray scattering instruments, allow you to look at objects that are typically the size of small proteins floating in solution. So yes, we get wonderful structural information from protein crystallography, but in the end of the day, you know, the, the natural, the, the molecules that are naturally available in biological systems are not crystalline. Um, they might be in the form of globular pl proteins floating in your blood um, or in, in soft tissue or whatever. So there's an awful lot of interest and, 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 and problems such as um, neurodegenerative decay that, that occurs in the brain in, in Alzheimer's, which we believe relates to um, uh, the, the clustering of these rather large objects. To understand these processes requires probes that can tell us about structure um, over much longer length scales. And this is, again, just a cartoon of a small globular protein. In looking at the form of these, the small angle scattering, you can get a direct measure on not just the size of these objects, but indirectly uh, on, the, on, the, on the shape of these objects and then see how they change during a biological process. But it's also applicable to um, porous material. So for example, bone is, is a material that is almost characterized by the distribution of holes in it. Small angle x-ray scattering can tell you about bone structure. Uh, and in engineering, many of the properties of important engineering materials are critically dependent on defects and vacancies and holes in the engineering material. So these are powerful techniques to look at objects or holes in objects um, over scales that are tens or hundreds of atoms. And then the final diffraction technique, and again, I'm just going to um, mention this in passing, we'll come back to this with some of the neutron work, is, is reflectometry. And this is a technique that you're, uh, well, it's a phenomenon that you're familiar with in everyday life. And if, if you observe oil or petrol uh, on a puddle, you might be familiar with these interference, um, these, these so-called neutron, neutron rings, which um, arise from the fact that um, uh, light can be scattered from the top and the bottom um, uh, surface of the layer, the thin film of oil on water. So you end up also seeing interference effects from the scattering. And here's a, another cartoon in a more uh, physics or materials engineering environment. Um, uh, by measuring the nature of the scattering of X-rays off a surface or an interface or a thin film uh, and observing uh, these interference rings, you can also get a, have a powerful probe of the structure um, of films and interfaces. And that's, again, it's a, it's a very widely used technique, the technique of reflectometry. It tells you, for example, about the structure of the, the films that uh, form the wall of cells, but it could also be used in an in, in engineering uh, context to tell you about the kind of films that we might have in a magnetic recording device on a, the coating of a CD, for example. Um, and I'm just measuring that in passing, mentioning that in passing, and we'll come back to that again with the neutrons, the applications of um, uh, small angle X-ray scattering and, and reflectometry. Going to take a break now, or not a break, we're going to change. So we've spent uh, the best part of two lectures talking about the applications of X-rays uh, through diffraction to look at the structure of materials. We're now going to switch to spectroscopic applications. And if you recall from lecture one, we said that are broadly, well, we actually, we said there were two types of spectroscopy. We, we implied a third. Um, we, we, we know that if we shine x-rays onto the atoms of a material, they can be absorbed, they can be excited into higher uh, energy states or even excited so the electrons leave the atom. Um, and that that absorption technique is X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Um, and we also saw that um, when such a system relaxes, excited states can fall back into ground states to give out X-rays. And that fluorescence is the basis of X-ray fluorescence um, <clears throat> uh, spectroscopy. And with, with bright, fine beams, we can use these techniques to provide 
chemical fingerprints um, with spatial resolutions, which are a micron and, and actually nowadays much, much less. So tens of nanometers typically. Um, <coughs> we also noted at the point at the time rather, that one consequence of that excitation process is that you can produce um, uh, photoelectrons. So if you shine sufficiently energetic light on the system, you can eject the electrons completely. And of course, if you know the energy of the, the light that comes in, and if you can measure the energy of the photo excited electrons, you can figure out how, how deeply bound they were. And that's the, that's the basis of techniques um, uh, that probe core and uh, valence level electrons. So for core level, you need hard X-rays. Um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is the name of that technique um, to probe the much less tightly bound valence electrons that are implicated in bonding um, and tell us an awful lot more about um, chemical structure and bonding. You probably only need ultraviolet and hard ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet um, photoelectron spectroscopy uh, at these lower energies here is used to, to probe um, with great sensitivity electronic states. And again, just very schematically, the, the absorption measurement is very straightforward. We shine photons of a measured incident intensity onto the sample, and we measure the intensity of the photons that pass through, uh, and the absorbance is just I over I naught. Um, um, in fluorescence, what we measure is the, uh, the intensity and energy of the photons, the light that come off. And we can do that in one of two ways. Um, we can either direct the photons into a detector, which itself is able to measure intensity as a function of, of energy. So this is an energy dependent um, uh, detector, a detector whose sensitivity is also energy dependent, sorry, who's, who's um, yeah, who, that can, can discriminate between photons of different energies. Or alternatively, we can put a discriminator in front of a detector uh, and the discriminator will probably be just a, a simple monochromator, a crystal that we can rotate. And by rotating that crystal, we can select photons um, with a spectrum of energy scattering um, uh, um, uh, that are contained in the incident beam. And then the detector doesn't have to have any particular energy discrimination. Um, it simply has to be able to detect photons. So either way, we can measure the intensity of the fluorescence as a function of the energy. Uh, and then finally, if the process gives rise to uh, photoionized electrons, we have to have a means of uh, measuring the energy of those electrons. And we do this through the same principle uh, as a mass spectrometer works. So we have a, we have a charged um, uh, particle. Um, and in, case of the, in this case, of course, the mass is known. It's the mass of the electron. Uh, and actually what we're measuring um, by measuring the deflection through a given magnetic field um, is the velocity of those, um, of those electrons. And this is the basis of, and we'll, we'll look at this in a bit more detail later on, of the Auger effect, um, or, or sorry, of the application of the Auger effect and uh, uh, photoelectron spectroscopy. And as I said, um, after photoionization, this is really just repeating myself, after photoionization, just to drive home the point, um, here is the, the excited um, uh, 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 atom uh, with, a, with a hole in a, in a low-lying state. And then the relaxation process either gives rise to fluorescence or to, um, or to a further photoionization, which is the base of the OJ effect. And it's the fluorescence that we'll be uh, focusing on here. Okay, so I'm gonna divide spectroscopy up into two bits. First of all, absorption spectroscopy, and then we'll look briefly at, at fluorescence. Um, and as we already know, you know, as we shine light of um, increasing energy on the material, so we uh, are able to excite increasingly tightly bound uh, electrons. And we see shells of increasing depth or um, tightness of binding. So this might be part of the spectrum from gold. Actually, there ought to be a K shell, but in this particular measurement, we didn't go to high enough energy to look at the K shell. One thing that you notice is that as you go to lower and lower energies, that is less and less tightly bound electrons, so the edge gets less and less sharp. And that reflects the fact that the core electrons are very tightly bound and they're almost completely insensitive to the chemical binding or the chemical character of the element. As you go to less and less tightly bound electrons, so those higher uh, 
energy electron states become more implicated in the binding. And instead of seeing sharp states, you start to see shapes, states whose energy is, is tuned somewhat um, through entering into chemical binding with the things around them. And in the case of metals, for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, metallic en energy levels, the, 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 the valent states or the least tightly bound states actually are no longer discrete uh, energy states. There's a whole continuum or a band of energy. So typically for metals, we'll see a progression from sharp um, edges to, in this case, this is the highest, uh, the, the band that corresponds to the, the lowest, um, the least tightly bound electrons, the highest energy states, you see, you don't, you no longer see a distinct edge, you see a broad continuum, which reflects the fact that the metal gold, the, the highest energy states are now just a, a band, a, a spectrum of, of energy levels. Now, one of the things we can do with synchrotron x-rays is we can tune the energy um, uh, um, with great resolution through that edge. And when we start to do that, we observe that the edge actually has um, a, a much finer structure associated with us. And that the analysis of the electronic structure or the, the, the absorption pan at the edge um, provides uh, an additional probe of, of electronic structure. And we, we find there are two regimes here. Um, so, so this is the um, uh, an absorption edge uh, uh, from iron in the form of a thin film. When we look at this in, in, in high resolution, what we find is that there's a little bit of structure um, at the edge itself, and this is blown up here. So we see it's not a sharp edge, it's actually got some structure to it. Um, and this is called the X-ray absorption near edge spectrum. It's the basis of a technique called Zanes. Um, and then at higher energy, we see a number of very distinct. So beyond the absorption edge, um, we can see an extended region where we see additional structure. And this is known as XFs, um, extended X-ray fine structure. So Zanes tends to, to, to um, cover the region up to and slightly above the edge. Um, so perhaps 50 electron volts um, above the edge. And then XFs is the, the, the whole energy range um, well beyond that. And what we'll see is that this gives us information about the electronic structure of that specific element and its chemical environment. And let's, let's look at why. So we'll start off with, with Zanes and think about what is going on in the Zanes um, um, spectrum. Well, in the Zanes spectrum, and we just look at this cartoon in the bottom right, um, uh, of course, the, the, the electronic transition that we're exciting is from some kind of ground state into states which are just below or at the point of photoionization. Once you go well beyond that, um, you, you, you go well beyond the edge. Um, so you could imagine that what this process probes is transitions into um, the electronic energy levels um, uh, uh, right, um, the, 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 the least tightly bound energy levels, those um, uh, uh, orbitals that are most involved in chemical binding. Now, I keep saying this, um, the intensity of those transitions will depend on the spectroscopic selection rules. Um, and at the risk of being too mathematical, but sometimes people are more comfortable with this, um, the intensity of this transition, PIF, is proportional to um, the, the, the this, this term here is just a, a, a mathematical representation of the selection rule. Um, um, uh, and essentially, it's the, it's the origin of the, the selection rules, which we've already cited, which is that the orbital um, uh, uh, the orbital angular momentum number has to change by plus and minus one. Uh, and secondly, it's proportional to how many states there are at that energy that can accept this electron. So if the state is completely full, there is nowhere for the electron to go and you will not see a transition. So it's, it's, it's proportional to the, um, the orbital character of this state and how much space there is um, how much vacancy is there is at that energy level. So, so what we see is a transition that first of all tells, now in general, we're excite, exciting from um, the ground state, the, 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 the lowest, the most tightly bound state, which is an S electron. So this tells us that the transition um, is only strong for an S to P transition. 
So that already tells us that there's a way of discriminating between uh, a p-type, an s, a p, or a d-type electron um, uh, uh, orbital here. Um, and secondly, it's proportional to the 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 um, the extent to which that state's filled. Now, I, I won't go into the detail, but suffice to say that when you take a Zane's spectrum, it's usually complemented with a calculation as to what the spectrum would look like depending on the S, P, or D character of these states and the and the um, uh, and the extent to which it's occupied. So the combination of Zane's and calculation of the electronic structure, or rather calculation of model electronic structures, allows you to con confirm that the local binding um, of this particular atom is has, has such and such a character. So it tends to be done in conjunction with computational um, uh, chemists. Uh, and this would be a typical Zane's um, spectrum. So without again, without going into the details, um, this transition from here to here um, is from an S to a P-like orbital. Um, it's, 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 it's relatively intense. Um, uh, transition into this orbital, however, is forbidden because it's completely full. So you see no um, uh, absorption here. And then the other orbitals have a mixture of, uh, of P and other character. And, and to actually um, uh, confirm the, 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 the detailed um, measurement, you then have to perform a rather more calculated, um, sophisticated uh, calculation of exactly what the, the electronic structure is here and then compare that with your measurement. So to give you an example, um, uh, this is a set of measurements across uh, of a series of compounds at the center of which there is a, a, a heavy transition um, element. So these are compounds that go from the, um, uh, that contain the atom rhenium all the way through to gold. And as you go uh, in this direction in the periodic table, you find that the, the D subshell is successively filled up with electrons. So at rhenium, it's half filled. There are five uh, D electrons in the 5D subshell. Uh, and by the time you get to gold, that D subshell is completely full. So if you were to measure the Zane spectrum uh, from the rhenium compound across to um, the gold compound, what you will see is that the, the part of the spectrum that corresponds to the absorption from the ground state up into the 5D shell gets successively less intense as the D subshell gets fuller and fuller and as the, the vacancies are, are, are filled up. And that's exactly what you see here. So the rhenium compound has a sharp, intense transition. And as, the, as it fills up successively from osmium through iridium through platinum to gold, so that particular line um, disappears. Um, so this, this tells us um, not only that the, the a particular element is present, but it also tells you about the electronic structure of that element. And with modeling, um, you, can, you can confirm that the element adopts a particular um, binding um, character in, in, in the material. So you can confirm that in, in these particular cases, that rhenium or gold uh, were bound in a molecular structure in the complex being studied in a particular way. Uh, so to give you an example of this, here's an example from the, from, from the chemical industry. Um, uh, as many of you will know, uh, chemical industry is uh, the, the, the key enabler in the chemical industry is the production of catalysts, which very specifically um, make chemical reactions run at lower temperatures and much more efficiently. Um, they tend to be materials based on heavy uh, metal elements and particularly rather precious elements like platinum and palladium. Um, uh, uh, and a, a key driving force in developing catalysts is to ensure that you use as little of these present precious me metals as possible and you use them as efficiently as possible. So it's very important to understand the mechanism of the particular catalyst uh, and also to devise ways of spreading uh, uh, a small amount of catalyst as thinly as possible. So, you know, if you, if you just had a lump of the platinum compound, its surface area would be very low and it would, um, it would actually have a, 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 a very low efficiency per kilo of the material. And the way in which we make these materials most efficient is first of all, to produce them in chemical forms where the, the individual molecules are as efficient as possible as a catalyst. And then to distribute them as finely as possible 
over the surface of a supporting powder or a porous material. So one of the questions, and here's a, here's a real example, the company BASF has developed a catalyst to add hydrogen to the chem compound nitrobenzene to form another compound called aniline. It's an important chemical process, and they've developed a catalyst where the active ingredient is a very expensive platinum containing compound. They've also found that they can boost the efficiency even more with the addition of, a, of another material containing molybdenum. It sounds like black magic. It is actually to a large extent the development of these catalysts. But people in trying to understand how they work and to develop better ones, they're starting to apply um, direct techniques to look at the structure and also the distribution of the catalyst over what is called the support. So in general, we, we, we provide support and we distribute them by um, uh, spraying them over fine powder particles. And the question in this case is, first of all, if you spray the active ingredient over the fine powder, um, does it coat and infiltrate the powder particles uniformly? Does it just form a shell on the outside? Does it, um, does it fill up the middle? Is it distributed in an uneven way? within the particles. So it's important to chemists to know where their active ingredient has gone. And secondly, what is the active ingredient? And there's some lovely work um, uh, performed. Again, this is diamond work, but this is the kind of thing that would be done anywhere. Uh, we've actually done work with the um, um, South African company, Sasol, uh, precisely in the development of other types of catalyst. Um, so the first measurement was actually done was fluorescence tomography. So we looked at individual uh, uh, examples of these fine particles. So this, the bar here is 10 microns, so it's a hundredth of a millimeter across. And the fluorescence tomography tells us just where the elements are distributed. Where is the molybdenum compound? Where is the platinum compound? Um, I'm afraid I'm colorblind, so I can't tell which is red and which is green. Um, but clearly, um, and when we pick this out, we find that the, the distribution of the molybdenum and platinum is not uniform. There's more of it at the surface of the particle than in the bulk. And that's important to know because it tells us we might want to use different particles to make sure that more of it's on the surface than in the bulk. Okay, so that tells us where the, the element is, but what the, what the chemists want to know is, what is the chemical form? What is the active ingredient and how is it distributed? And what we can do now with Zanes is we can focus in on a particular pixel down to about a micron and we can perform the Zanes measurement. So these are Zanes measurements at the molybdenum and the platinum um, uh, edge. And we can compare, so in the case of the platinum compound, oh, I've lost some of the labeling here, but these different lines are the, um, the Zane spectrum of uh, a number of compounds that the chemist suspects might be present on the catalyst. And in this case, what they did is they, they matched the, the measured Zane spectrum, this here, against the possible chemical components. And they were able to say that to get this spectrum, you need a certain ratio of these individual chemical components. So in the case of platinum, what that allowed the chemist to do was to pick out not just where the platinum was, but what precise platinum species were present in an individual particle of the catalyst and to do the same with molybdenum. Um, in the case of molybdenum, it was, it was introduced in the form of a particular molybdenum molecule and the Zane spectrum uh, confirmed that yes, indeed, actually most of the molybdenum was, formed, was present in that form. So perhaps you can see that this provides us with a really powerful tool to determine at practically micron resolution exactly what chemical compound you've got in a region of your, your sample. And they were able, in the case of the platinum, to say that the, the, the distribution of platinum compounds on an individual particle um, look something like this. So some of it is platinum metal, some of it is platinum oxide, some of them is a form of platinum chloride, and some of them is a platinum chlorine salt. Um, and that is, is probably the most powerful direct probe of what is present um, at, a, at a micron level in an active chemical catalyst. To give you one more example in completely changing the field, but this is probably in the top five high impact results that we've had at Diamond. Uh, and this is the application of Zanes now to, um, uh, to, to archaeology and cultural heritage. And the example of um, cultural heritage, but again, you know, it, it can be applied to all sorts of fields, is um, in the preservation of a, um, of a 16th century battleship. 
So this is the preservation of the, the, the Mary Rose. So the Mary Rose was um, Henry VIII's favourite battleship, uh, which sadly sank in, a, in an estuary in England, the estuary of the Medway, in 1545. And it sat, this is a depiction of um, Henry VIII, uh, famously um, grumpy um, uh, king, um, uh, bad-tempered king. Um, but his, his, his battleship sat there for 450 years and eventually it was raised to the surface um, in the 1980s. And the first thing that the, um, the archaeologists, I'm not sure they are, I probably didn't call them archaeologists, but the people who wanted to preserve this ship uh, wanted to do was to make sure that the wood, which had sat in the water for 450 years, was stabilised. Now, if you bring it to the surface uh, and you just leave it in the air, the water will evaporate and the wood that has has got really soggy over the centuries will dry out and it'll crumble and decay. And the process for preservation actually was pioneered in, in, in Sweden. So a few hundred kilometers away from where Christine is at the moment uh, in Copenhagen, they pioneered a technique to preserve the wood of the battleship Vasa. And what they did is they replaced, and this is we simply, or not we, but our collaborators copied this process. They replace the water by a heavier molecule um, called polyethylene glycol and that infiltrates the wood you take the water out and at the end of um, well practically 20 years you end up with wood that contains this much heavier uh, non-volatile polymer PEG and you can get rid of the water and that's great and that means you can then display um, the battleship in the open air the public can come and see it without having to constantly either keep it in a big water tank or to spray it with water and and here we just have some uh, radiographs to show how the the PEG has infiltrated the um, uh, the, the wood over the years. Now in the case of the Vasa this was the pioneering experiment unfortunately um, the Vasa after a year or two started to fall apart uh, and the reason was when they looked into it is that inside the wood and this was we discovered this later to be the case with this battleship the Mary Rose the wood over the centuries had become impregnated also with sulfur. So bacteria had started to live in the wood and these bacteria um, deposited sulfur compounds so that when the wood was um, brought to the surface and the water is replaced by the PEG, the sulfur remained in the wood. And the wood and sulfur exposed to oxygen produced oxidized form of sulfur, which ultimately created sulfuric acid. So over the first few years that the Vasa was displayed in the air to the general public, particularly round um, uh, nails in the wood, so the iron in the nails of the wood catalyzed this oxidation process. Um, the creation of sulfuric acid, which of course is very damaging to the wood, led to the destruction of the wood. So we knew about this um, and the question was how could one measure whether the sulfur in the wood, well, did the Mary Rose wood have sulfur in it? If it had sulfur, what form did the sulfur take? Um, because sulfur has many forms, you know, you've got sulfites in, in wine, you've got sulfate as in sulfur, as which you find in sulfuric acid, you have sul native sulfur and you have sulfides, um, which you find in, 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 in minerals like cinnabar and so, no, actually I'm not sure cinnabar, I think, I think, yeah, yeah, no, cinnabar is a sulfide. Um, um, but the point is that um, sulfur can adopt many forms. So first of all, what we did is we took samples of the Mary Rose wood. Here's a sample of the Mary Rose wood. And then we performed uh, sulfur fluorescence. And this, this heat map tells you, told us that the wood contained lots of sulfur. And then when the Zane spectrum um, was formed, so the Mary Rose, the, the Zane spectrum, the Mary Rose um, wood, around this edge revealed um, that some of the sulfur was there as free um, native sulfur or even as sulfides, but there was a significant amount of sulfur in this oxidized sulfate form. So the Zane spectrum told us um, that actually there was a problem there. And that led to a, a restoration project. And here the chemist got to work saying, okay, if the wood contains sulfur in the form of sulfate, how do we bring the sulfate Back. So do we take the sulfur out? The answer was there was no practical way of doing it without destroying the wood. But how can we reduce the sulfur from the high oxidation state found in sulfate back down to a form where it wouldn't create sulfuric acid? 
and they devised this clever wash, which was a reducing agent containing carbonate, um, and and then discovered that um, uh, the the wash um, over a, an extended period took the sulfate signal um, out of the Zane spectrum and gave them the confidence that um, that this particular treatment would protect the wood against the erosion due to, due to sulfuric acid. So if you come to the UK, to Portsmouth, and go to the Royal Naval Dockyard there, what you'll find is this beautiful exhibition where you can directly you know, you can walk around it, you can see it there, it's sitting out in there. But every few years, wood samples are taken to make sure that the treatment continues to be effective and that sulfuric acid, or rather sulfate, the precursor to sulfuric acid, acid has, has gone away. Okay, the other technique, and we'll we'll do we'll establish this, and we'll probably finish in about ten or fifteen minutes' time. So that Zanes tells us about the distribution of elements and the chemical state they're in. Um, the complementary technique is XAFs, extended X-ray absorption, fine structure. This occurs at the high energy edge, uh, high energy side of the edge, and this arises um, uh, from the photoionized electrons so and it's a technique that's akin to interfering ripples um, on a pond so when you excite photoelectrons from uh, an array of atoms here um, what you find is that the photoelectrons themselves have a wave-like form so you you can regard every single atom in the structure as the center of uh, a, a widening um, uh, wave front of or a widening set of ripples. Um, so if you excite multiple atoms all at the same time, all of these um, widening circular ripples will overlap and interfere with, with one another. And just as we spoke about with the Young Slit experiment, where Young demonstrated that light had a wave-like form uh, and proved that through the interference effects, through the constructive and the destructive interference, you get S similar constructive and destructive interference from these scattered um, uh, uh, photoionized electrons. Uh, and you know, the cartoon here, or the picture here, um, depicts what we're all familiar with when we, we say rep ripples on a pond, where the, where, the, where the peaks in the ripples overlap, you get twice the peak, and where a peak and a trough overlaps, uh, where, where the two waves are in, um, uh, uh, completely out of sync with each other, 180 degrees apart in terms of their phase, you get the, the peak and the trough cancelling each other. So the, the net result of the uh, photoionization process is, uh, uh, is, is interference that gives rise to peaks and troughs in the, um, in the absorption spectrum at the high energy side. So essentially, these peaks and troughs correspond to um, uh, interference between photo ionized electrons and the interference um, and, and, and the, 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 the fringes that you see here, the peaks and troughs that you see here, are separated um, by uh, odd multiples of half of the wavelength. So, so where you have um, the, the, the scattering waves um, um, separated by something that's a multiple uh, an, uh, an integral number of the wavelength, you'll get constructive interference. Where it's separated by um, an integral number of half wavelengths, you'll get destructive interference, just as you did in the Young Slit experiment, just as you do um, in, in, in the diffraction experiment. This is, in a sense, it's diffraction of the photoionized electrons. So by, by, under, by being able to measure where these peaks and troughs are, you can infer what the despacing of the atoms in the material is that has given rise to this photoionization event. And of course, you know, this is specific. This only arises from the photoionized electrons from the iron atoms. So you could have a really complicated structure containing all sorts of atoms, but if you tune the synchrotron energy just to the iron edge, you only get the iron atoms contributing to this. So it's a lovely technique because it allows you to select a particular atom and say, okay, where are all the other atoms around it uh, of, 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 the, of the same character? Um, so that's that's the sort of principle. Now, again, um, I'm, I'm gonna just take you through a little bit of the maths to establish how you then analyze it. Um, if, if you'll 
less comfortable with the mass, it doesn't matter. We're going to come up with a simple result anyway in a principle. Um, but what we really want to be able to do is to um, uh, relate the, the energy of these peaks and troughs um, to the wavelength of the photoelectron, knowing that the interference condition is we need an odd, an odd multiple of um, lambda over twos for destructive interference. So it's all about calculating the minima here, which is what corresponds to the destructive interference. Now we know that um, um, the wavelength and the energy of the photoionized electrons um, can be related through the de Broglie relation. So the, the momentum of the electron is Planck's constant divided by the wavelength of the electron. And we know that the energy of the electron is its momentum squared over twice the mass. So we have a simple um, relation between the energy of the photoelectron and um, its wavelength. The energy of the photoelectron is simply the photon energy minus the binding energy of the electron. So it's the, the excess electron it has once it's escaped the binding from the atom. Um, and by combining these two, we have a simple formula for the wavelength of the photoionized electron, um, the, the energy of the photons and, and the binding energy. And as we said, the condition for minima is that the separation between um, the, the the, the two scattering sites, D, um, is, is an odd multiple of lambda over two, or um, that the separation D is, is, um, is, is one, three, or five, et cetera, times, times the wavelength. So what we find is a condition for the minima in the XAFs spectrum um, uh, in terms of the, the spacing between the centers of the circular wavelets for the uh, photoionized electron. So this is the, the spacing between, in, in this case, the ion atoms, but of course it could apply to any atom. Now, in transforming that, um, the information, the, the, the position of the minima into information about the structure in real space, just as in diffraction, the scattering pa pattern that we see is the, is the Fourier transform um, of the real scattering pattern, it turns out that it's um, it's it's convenient to try to rephrase or re-describe this problem um, in, in terms of one over wavelength, or what we call um, where we talked about the reciprocal lattice and diffraction uh, in terms of the the wave vector of the um, of the of the excitation, and we'll come back to the wave vector and reciprocal measures when we when we start talking about neutrons. And again, if you're not happy with the math, that's fine, but there'll be people among you who are very familiar with Fourier transforms and we're dealing with things in terms of wave vectors and so forth. It's the, it's the familiar language in, in solid state physics and describing electrons in the structure. Um, the, the basic principle is this, that it, rather than describing um, the absorbance in terms of the energy, which is the familiar form of the diffraction pattern, we re- um, phrase, um, we transform uh, the measurement um, uh, from absorption in terms of energy to absorption in terms of the so-called wave vector, which is 2 pi over the wavelength. And without going through the rather straightforward mathematical manipulation, what that means um, is that we can describe the absorbance now um, uh, in terms of one over the wavelength of the um, of, of the photo emitted um, radiation, and we end up with a pattern that looks a little bit like this. Now you can start to see that, um, and, and this is simply called the XAFs function. Um, the information at high values of k is very indistinct. So to bring out these features, if we multiply this by um, k squared or k cubed, we amplify the features at, at higher k, and we end up with a pattern that looks like this. And the Fourier transform of this. Um, is simply the distribution of the scattering centers in real space. Um, so the, the, just as the diffraction pattern is the Fourier transform of the real structure, so the, um, the x has function is the Fourier transform of the real structure. So in performing the Fourier transform, you get from this measurement the distribution in space of the atoms around the central atom which is which is being excited so what this gives us and to cut to the chase this provides us with a powerful method of determining what the distribution of atoms is around a particular atom of interest 
And it's now a technique that doesn't require the material to be crystalline. Um, it, it simply measures directly the real space distribution independent um, of where it, whether it has crystalline um, order or not. Um, and so it's, 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 it's a technique that's, that's also powerful for materials that don't have high degrees of crystalline order. And I'll give you two examples to finish with, and then we'll stop with, um, uh, with XAFs. Um, here's an example of work done with Manchester University um, that has a very strong research interest in stabilizing nuclear waste. You know, if, if your power industry has, has some reliance on nuclear energy, then one of the things you absolutely have to do is to make sure that the radioactive end product of, um, of nuclear power station is bound up tightly in, um, in, a, in, a, in a glassy inorganic matrix so that it can be stored as safely as possible. And one of the candidates, um, also because it was abundant and relatively cheap, was, was to ask whether or not um, uh, uranium as one of the byproducts of a, a, a chemical reactor could be bound up uh, in an iron oxide compound which would then be fired and made glassy um, uh, based on on the very common mineral hematite um, which has a formula of Fe, Fe203. So what the materials chemists were doing was um, was combining the the uranium compound which could be from your nuclear waste with a precursor to the hematite and then through a chemical process and heating process to try to insert the uranium uh, at low concentrations in the hematite. Now, if you try to perform a diffraction experiment of that, you wouldn't see the uranium in the structure because it's, um, it's, it's, it's not directly part of the crystal structure. It's, well, it's part of the crystal structure, but it's there as an impurity in a relatively low concentration. So what the, the experimentalists want to do is, is to understand um, how and where the uranium was bound up in the, in, 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 the, in the crystal structure. So what they did was they, and, and also the extent to which that depended on the nature of the, um, of the chemical processing. And EXAFs gave them a probe that was specific. It was tuned to the uranium and it gave them information about what the local distribution of atoms was um, around uh, 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 around the, um, the the uranium um, so and what they discovered and I won't go into all the details is that actually uh, under prolonged heating you could create a, a robust mineral uh, which was very similar to hematite um, but th that bound the uh, the uranium tightly into the structure and then finally, so nice example where you don't have to have um, crystalline order of, in this case, the uranium, but you can determine the great precision where the uranium is in the structure. And then finally, uh, another chemical example, and I'll stop then um, uh, for questions, discussion, whatever. Um, this is actually, this is an old experiment. I deliberately chosen a, you know, an almost 20 year old experiment um, just to indicate how things have improved in the last 20 years. Um, so. The problem here comes back to catalysis. So, um, so this is a, a chemical compound containing palladium. Um, it's used to accelerate certain times of organic synthetic reactions. But of course, what the chemist would like to be able to do um, is to run these reactions with as small amount of catalyst as possible. So to run it in the highest possible dilution. Um, but as you dilute this, so this, this, this catalyst, which is in the form of two units, chemically it's a dimer, um, uh, has, a, has a tendency to dissociate into separate uh, monomeric species. And it was of interest to the chemist to know that if you try to run the experiment under very dilute conditions, what was present? Was it this, was it this, or was it some combination of the two? And in performing EXAFs measurements on solutions with greater and greater degrees of dilution, so 5,000 parts per million to 50 parts per million, 100 times more dilute. What the XF spectrum revealed on dilution um, after Fourier transforming was a secondary peak. Uh, and what that told them was that as you diluted it further, there was direct evidence that the dimer dissociates and 
produces a measurable amount of the, the monomeric species. Now this measurement here, this is 50 parts per million. This, is a, this was done on a 20 year old spectrometer with modern, brighter, uh, higher resolution spectrometers. Um, you can perform these measurements at least a thousand times brighter, sorry, to a thousand, to a thousand times lower levels. So modern XHAFS techniques um, allow us to look, provide chemically specific um, information at parts per billion, for example, in this case, in, in solution. So XAFS is increasingly important now as a means of identifying chemical species at very low dilution, for example, in water. So environmental chemists, um, geochemists, and so forth are increasingly using this technique to identify very low levels of impurity to determine what the impurities are at very low levels um, in, in solution. And the same could also be true in a, um, in, in a, in a biological context. You know, if you have a, a material in your blood, for example, or in biological tissue, but it's at very low levels and you want to determine whether that element is present and if so, what chemical form it takes. Um, XAFS is now able to do this at, at levels that are approaching um, parts per billion because of the brightness of modern synchrotron techniques. So I'm going to stop there because we move on to, ooh, don't know what happened there. We move on to a couple of other spectroscopic techniques. So next lecture, what I'll do is move on to fluorescence. And we'll also look at how uh, modern synchrotron X-ray spectroscopy can also be used um, in, in a variety of techniques that tell us about the structure and magnetism in materials. And I'll give you another cultural uh, heritage example and show you how synchrotrons have been used to look under the skin of paintings and reveal what was painted beneath or overpainted by, by artists such as Van Gogh and so forth. So I'm going to stop there if I stop sharing. And apologies for the, um, the first few slides. Um, I didn't actually, couldn't actually see directly what it was that you were seeing. Um, but in, in future, thanks for stopping me, Cara, yeah. Christine, and, and do always stop me in future. Yeah, for sure. This is, uh, we were, I mean, I was thinking it was still the same slide, so it was maybe a smaller format, but maybe it would work if, you could check, uh, if we were really missing something, uh, because it might not have uh, passed one slide after the other. But I, I think that you were staying on the same slide. So. If you bring the first uh, slide on the screen, if you don't mind. Arvin. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, it was hang on. just before the, the copper when you were explaining. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, so it looked a bit different when then you were showing the next one. So, so hang on. So, so Christine, were you, was I not changing slides? It was not changing, but it seemed. Oh, I'm really time. sorry. Oh, goodness. And right. But would you mind to come back to the structure you had? Um, the yeah, sure. The copper. Uh, so what I don't understand now is why this isn't. Hang on. I'm trying to change these now. Uh, what a pain. Right, hang on. Um, so that's that's changing, right? It does. Is that changing? Yes. Uh, so if you go back. Well, back yeah. Back. Yeah, so I started. I started here actually. Well, here. I started talking about the Jan Teller effect. So, so we didn't miss anything. So, oh, this one actually we didn't see. Yeah. This is what we were expecting to see the the text just before this one. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So that's the only one you might have missed, and it was really I spoke to. I simply said that there are important classes of materials whose um, whose properties are determined by this so-called Jan Teller effect, where you have a partly partial filling of um, electronic energy levels and it's implicated in high temperature superconductivity which is is still an outstanding problem in physics we still don't understand it which is remarkable after 35 years um, um, uh, but we do know that effects such as this are clearly implicated in it and resonant x-ray scattering techniques gives us direct probes about the occupation and the nature of, of these orbitals and how they might order um, in in uh, a solid state material so I think in a nutshell, that's probably what was missed. Um, oh, goodness. Yes. Right. Okay, but it, I'm it, I, am I unshared now? Now you're unshared. Now we see you. Good. So it's really, really good. So do we have any specific questions? So that's from the student. 
just going to get the chat up. There was indeed for the, the high temperature superconductors, it will be quite interesting as well to see. I guess that uh, Pascal might speak a little bit as well on that. Oh, undoubtedly. And Pascal is an expert in magnetism okay. as well. Yeah. And, and I, I think from the previous uh, presentation as well, we had uh, in different topics, the magnetism aspect was quite interesting. So indeed, if we, we look a bit more with the instrument as well and how you, those techniques that you're describing are implemented with the different... Uh, whether neutron and x-ray, but I guess we will look at this as well from the x-ray. So, but from the, um, the, the, the phenomenon, so are there any quite, uh, I mean, some questions that, that could be raising from uh, what Andrew has uh, shown? Was and I should say, you know, when I, when I was a grad student, techniques like exafs were just being developed and frankly weren't very helpful. They were the kind of techniques people were saying, you know, let's see if we can get information from material like this. And they were the kind of technique where the quality of the information you got was really not great. And now they have, because the modern sources are so much brighter and detectors are so much better, they've become mainstream techniques rather than just oddities that a small number of people are trying to develop with the potential to be useful. But, but any synchrotron will have several... Um, spectrometers that allow you to measure zanes and exafs um, probably still mostly by chemists because chemists are the people most interested in um, the chemical character of materials but of course biology is biology is also uh, largely driven by by by, by chemistry um, so looking uh, from the Energetic point of view as well. So yes, the chemistry. So so there are a lot of development. I mean that that's quite a lot of innovation that can come from uh, all those techniques, definitely. And and maybe to think as well in terms of building new material as well. That's one of the things looking at uh, sample because one of the things that you were speaking about was as well the difficulty to prepare one good sample. So the technique. Uh, this is one thing. Now they become quite effective but indeed to have a sample which is easy enough or a sample that uh, can really bring you to some new material. So there uh, are also those type of thing that uh, could be covered. Well, well, the whole area of materials discovery is, um, uh, you know, so the, you know, the traditional chemical technique of coming up with a new, you know, so where do new materials come from? Um, uh, an awful lot of them have been discovered more or less by accident, um, but there are also materials that, that have been designed. So, you know, famously, the lithium compound that was first used in lithium ion batteries was designed uh, by a man called John Goodenough, um, who actually examined my PhD thesis when I was a, was a student. I, he taught me in organic chemistry. Um, and he had an intuitive feel for the combination of elements that would produce a material with a specific property um, and that that can also work but you know in an ideal world when we're trying to discover new materials we would very rapidly we would want to be very able to very rapidly put together all sorts of combinations of elements and see what we got out and be able to measure them so one of the developments is the ability to accelerate the preparation of thousands and thousands of different materials with slightly different properties and then look at more particularly what their properties are. Um, and you can start to do that also with synchrotrons because, you know, in a typical synchrotron experiment 20 years ago, you might spend days, weeks, months making one sample and then you take it to the, the synchrotron and you measure its property. And that cycle of um, preparing and measurement would typically take months you know um so one of the developments is to try and automate the synthesis side so that you can make a library well we mentioned this last one when we were looking at these libraries of potential drug um, compounds now in materials chemistry people are increasingly using automated robotic techniques to make hundreds and hundreds of different compounds in just a few days and then put them through the synchrotron beam to see if they have the right structure and to some extent the right properties so we we're this process of trial and error you know mm -hmm. let's make it and see what its properties are it's not completely random of course 
as a chemist, you go in saying, well, I, I think the right material will have these sorts of elements in it because it, it's like this other material. Um, but even so, there are so many different possible ways of putting elements together. You've got, you've, you've actually got to use this combination of intuition, but hugely accelerated trial and error. Um, and that's starting to come through to put the synthetic side together with the measurement side. Mm -hmm. So that's um, yeah, the evolution as well of uh, the, those automatisms that did the problem. Yeah. So the, this, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe you wanted to, to ask something. Yeah. Christine? Yes, oh. um, uh, thanks, Andrew, for, uh, for the lecture. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, I, um, I'm curious to know, it's like uh, recently I read uh, an article about um, some research about colored X-ray. So if you can, if oh. you can tell us. I think, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not I sure. remember in the last few weeks, so there are some research being done about uh, a way to produce like a colored x-ray ah now if i'm honest i'm not sure what that would be because you know so normally we associate color with a different part of the um visible spectrum or more generally right. we think about color as um, that property that changes with the energy or the wavelength of the radiation yeah um, so when you talk about spectral distribution of x-rays, of course, you're, you're really just sort of saying, you know, there is a spectrum from low energy through medium to high energy, which is centered at a few thousand electron volts. Um, so I'm, if I'm absolutely on, would you be able to find and send me the reference, uh, Abadala? Because um, I'm, I'm not um, sure what colored x-ray would be in that context. Yeah, um, I, I read it, it's like, the, some research about some research from CERN, they are talking about um, so it's like there is a possibility um, to use X-ray to get a colored uh, image and a colored photograph. So I, I will I will try to look at it. Could, could you? Uh, yeah, I may, I'd I may send it. Yeah, so, yeah. I'd gladly look at that. If I'm honest, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know, Christine. I, I, I'm looking to you as the CERN expert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, this is why it doesn't need a, a band either, but that would be interesting to, to investigate. Yeah. So was it anything as well yeah, yeah. that was mentioned in some of the earlier lectures, potentially, or it was really an article that you read from a scientific article? No, I, um, it, it was an article that I read uh, from Sam, I think. It's it was not somebody from the. Their, their, uh, right. yeah. Okay, but I, I will try uh, to have a look and I will, I will share. Yeah. If you have my email address, uh, Awadala, just 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 send it to yeah. me and I'll I'll see what I can yeah pick up. Um, I mean oh, the, the oh, word the word oh, color is used in other contexts as well, is it in sort of some atomic physics yeah. too? But um, I I yeah, I I'm I'm not the subatomic physicist here. I keep I keep describing Christine as one, but you're more of an accelerator physicist, I'm aren't you? On the accelerator side, indeed, but yeah. we will have as well. But let's look into this. There, there will be indeed more uh, courses as well that could potentially be connected uh, with the, yeah. the the neutron laser, the the high energy side. So then we can look at what could do that. That will be only in, in general. Yeah. But in the meantime, yes, we can we can maybe investigate. That. Yeah, that it could be. Mm. Okay. Uh, so then uh, one of the things, yeah, we were looking at uh, the, the, the biography maybe that you were mentioning before. Uh, you were looking at uh, showing us uh, some uh, reference book that could potentially be interesting. I think it was Camilla who was um, wondering or so, sorry, Christine, I, I missed some of that. You, the, the, your voice is not very clear, at least to me. Yeah, some uh, uh, reference uh, from geography that would have been... Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't quite get them to you before this meeting, but I promise um, 
immediate I've, I've got them now ah right so so you've got um now we have a question now we, now, we, now we have the reference wonderful thank you yeah so i'm looking at this it's coming up 3d coral x-ray make possible this non technology oh okay so this um So what it looks like, it's a way really of um, representing an X-ray pattern. Uh, so yeah, so so the, the the image, the photograph you get is is coloured. I guess the question is, what is the colour scale? What I imagine. Oh, okay, right. So actually, um, look, I need to look at it in greater detail. But I think what it's saying, Awadala, is. Um, these people are performing an x-ray making an x-ray image but the different components of the image which are made out of different things and it's on the first picture in the link that you sent which is really useful um you know they've got they've got a, a k wire i presume a potassium wire so i think this is it, it'll come back probably to the fluorescent component so if if you have a measurement like this which will be largely based on an absorption measurement but at the same time you measure the fluorescence you get a map that contains the chemical element information um, so and they're able to you know so i would imagine the metallic screw is made of a, a metal like i don't know titanium or stainless steel and that will have a completely different fluorescence um, signature than the bone for example so I think this is just a neat way of projecting out of your photograph the um, the elements of the photograph that contain different elements. So it's um, so it's like and actually you may so in my very first lecture I I showed uh, an X-ray fluorescence picture of uh, brain tissue which was um, had Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. and there was a map that showed the copper. And I forget what the other element was. It might have been zinc or sulfur. But the point is, this kind of map that's in your link um, could have been produced in, in that fashion. So I suspect this is just, I, for some reason, I can't go to the second page of your link, but I'll look at it properly later. But I, I'm guessing it's a fluorescence, X-ray fluorescence image on top of a normal um, three-dimensional radiogram. Yeah. And it, and it, oh. yeah, and it tells me it's it. So this is an article mostly about the um, the detector technology, which we actually use as well. And that's the other aspect of this is the technology that synchrotrons use and high energy physicists use. There's often a lot of crossover because at the end of the day, we're we're detecting things like photons um, for different reasons. But the technology that you'll use to detect the photons um, is often very very similar. So the Medipix technology that's referred to in this, um, we buy it and we put it in our instruments. Okay. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Okay, I, I, yeah. Thank you. And I can even read it in French as well. <laughs> it says at the top, <laughs> voir en français. <laughs> there you go. That's your bit of French for today, Christine. <laughs> You'll get me talking French one day. Okay. French question. So maybe from, uh, from Kedwin. Say again? Yeah, so, so, yeah, I don't know if we were about to have some French questions. So, I mean, that's really good. No, it's not possible. It's not possible. We will have to build up some questions, maybe. You'll have to build some up, and you can laugh at my accent. Yeah. My kids do. So, looking at the, indeed the, um, the different technology and the crossover between what high energy physics use in terms of detector and what we're using as well for the, the light source, I think it's quite an interesting aspect. It is, yeah. And you and the accelerator technology as well, you know, the magnet technology, the electron guns, the, the, there is some common ground. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, looking at uh, as well, we had. Uh, so yeah, Fatih could, well, she was describing, this is one of the things that we were discussing. So unfortunately she could not really speak. I'm not sure if she want to get uh, some words today, but then indeed she studied plasma physics as well at the very beginning. So it's quite interesting as well to see with respect to the accelerator as well, how everything could be related to those, um, those injections. But 
in the aspect of the, the light source, there is a lot of different elements that have to come together to be able to build something that, that makes sense. Huh? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, um, so Eve, yeah. Us to the way the mm, he's operating. So I'm sorry about the sound quality, Fatih. It's uh, bandwidth. <laughs> So, so Taivo, can, can you can you repeat, please, uh, Samuel? Why are you asking a question? No? I'm not sure. Not sure. Yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, feel free to ask again. But like, you are unmute. So, do you want to speak and do you want to share a concern or a question? No, maybe not. Okay, but again, feel free to ask questions, to send emails, so directly sure. or not to Andrew, and then next uh, uh, Tuesday, so we can uh, follow up as well on that, and then we will yeah. have those references that you were mentioning. And I'll do them right. It's only one or two, Christine. It's it's remarkable, but at kind of at the general level, there are very very few books that cover the breadth of. Um, there are some very specialized books, but they're you know. They, they'll be talking about a fraction of the course, um, but I'll certainly send a couple of references to yeah. modern, general, synchrotron science um, mm -hmm. textbooks. Yeah. And what we could as well have, uh, that's one of the, I mean, part of the presentation that were given, for instance, for the African light source as well, it was quite interesting cases as well, whether from the XFR, the DSI, sorry, or from potentially as well from Diamond with the, the star, the, the different development. So we could put this as well in a special library sure. and present it because it's quite a motivation as well to see what we can do with that. So beyond sure. technology then as well to, to link to, to that. Huh? Okay, and then next uh, presentation, so you will start a bit more with the neutron. Uh, so that's also Yeah, we'll move on to neutrons next time. Uh, we'll finish off spectroscopy and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at a whole different um, uh thank you very much um that's very kind thank thank you really appreciate yeah, it thank you a lot Ernest. thank you yeah okay and the phenomenon Super. this is the basis of everything if we want to understand uh, what happens we have to go back to the the roots huh? so and and i really like this idea that all of us i mean all of you as well have different background and, and it's so important to learn how all those problems are viewed with different eyes. Not only the photon eyes and the neutron eyes, but as well with uh, the expertise that comes from uh, what yeah. you've been learning over those years. And try to yeah. open up to, as well, new technologies. So I think it will be even more so in the next uh, session. So the next presentation will not be on Thursday. It seems that potentially the Thursday fit better for most of you. Unfortunately, the next two presentations will be on Tuesday, so hopefully... But it's recorded, it's recorded, isn't it? It will be recorded, same thing, so so that's as well what saves us, so it's really good. Yeah. And otherwise, yeah, so let's stay tuned, and then we'll... Thank uh, thanks, Christine, and safe. thanks everyone for, for your very kind comment, and I'm always ready for questions, and, you know, if you need to do this by email, then you, you've got my, my address. Th thank, thank you very much, that's lovely. See you again, hopefully, uh, next week. Take care, everybody. Have a great uh, okay. weekend. Take care. Bye, Bye for you. now. Bye. Bye. Have Thank a nice you. weekend. Au revoir. Bye. Au revoir. À la prochaine. À la prochaine. Hello, Fatih. Good. So then I will stop. Uh...